I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As anyone can plainly see, we are living in the last moments before the return of Jesus Christ. America is in a spiritual battle between good and evil, as we read in Ephesians 6.12, where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan is working overtime as he knows he has but a short time as we read in Revelation 12.12. 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Whether the secularists and progressives know it or not, they are of their father the devil. John 8.44 You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Ephesians 5, 11, and 12 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak for those things which are done by them in secret. Tyranny is the name of a system that exists to protect and enrich the managerial class while punishing everybody else. It's the kind of a system that might welcome unvaccinated illegal aliens and then fire American airline pilots who don't want the shot. That might be anarcho-tyranny. Does it exist? People debate it. Well, consider this story. According to new reporting in the Daily Wire, a ninth grade girl was sexually assaulted at Stonebridge High School in Loudoun County, Virginia in May. A boy allegedly wearing a skirt apparently went into the girl's bathroom and sexually assaulted this girl. The boy was arrested for forcible sodomy, and the counts are horrifying. This month, the boy was arrested again for allegedly assaulting a different girl at a different school. At a school board meeting in June, the superintendent of Loudoun County Schools, a man called Scott Ziegler, said the school board had no records of this assault. Watch. Do we have assaults in our bathrooms or our locker rooms regularly? I would hope not, but I would like clarification. To my knowledge, we don't have any records of assaults occurring in our restrooms. Scott Smith is the father of the girl who was allegedly assaulted in the bathroom at the school. He came to a school board meeting to explain what happened to his daughter and demand accountability, but before he could finish talking, he was tackled and arrested. A Loudoun County School Board meeting devolved into chaos Tuesday after the board ended public comment where nearly 250 people signed up. Deputies even tackled one man who was later arrested for disorderly behavior. Another man got a ticket for trespassing. Oh, disorderly behavior. He was talking at a public hearing, so they beat him. You should know that at the same moment all of this was happening, the man who wanted to report the sexual assault of his daughter in a bathroom by a boy wearing a skirt, at that same moment, the same school district was pushing a policy for students identifying as, quote, transgender and would allow students to use any bathroom they want. On the agenda for the contentious meeting, a proposed policy that's been just as controversial, policy 8040, which would require transgender and gender nonconforming students to be called by their preferred pronouns. It would also align with state law, allowing those students to use restrooms and be on sports teams that align with their gender identity. Luke Rosiak is a reporter at The Daily Wire. He broke this story, and we're happy to have him on tonight to explain it. Luke, thanks so much for coming on. Essentially, did we characterize the story correctly? Is that what you think happened? Yes, this story is one of the most disturbing I've ever worked on. It raises the possibility that the Loudoun County Public Schools covered up the rape of a 14-year-old girl at the hands of a boy wearing a skirt in order to pass a school policy that Democrats were adamant about passing. And as a result of concealing that, a second girl was raped last week uh, and to prevent all of this from coming out, potentially, they arrested the father of the victim, uh, tried to put him in jail, 
and he's now the face of domestic terrorism listed by uh, listed individually by the National School Boards Association all for coming to that meeting. He didn't come to that meeting because he's a bigot. A lot of people thought they knew that guy. They trotted out his picture, his embarrassing picture with his belly hanging out and his bloody face. They all thought they knew him. They knew nothing about him. This was a caring father who was involved because of something very personal that happened to his daughter. And if they would have shut up and listened to him for 30 seconds, they would have been heartbroken. Instead, they demeaned him, they arrested him, and they tried to put him in jail. I wonder, though, if they would have cared if they'd listened to him. I mean, if these allegations are true and the school board covered up the rape of a child in a bathroom, then maybe they wouldn't have cared had they heard from her father. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, after he was arrested at that school board meeting, the elected prosecutor of Loudoun County, who's a Soros-funded, far-left progressive who ran on a campaign about, uh, you know, ending mass incarceration, not charging people for minor crimes, she personally charged this guy for misdemeanor disorderly conduct. It's unheard of. The actual DA showed up and personally asked for jail time for disorderly conduct. Um, this is a woman who's very close with the school board. Um, you know, the, and, and, and after that, they gave him a no trespassing letter just a few days before the August 11th meeting where they finalized this transgender policy. It's hard to imagine they would have been able to pass that policy if this guy would have showed up and told his story. Right. Uh, but none of the things that liberals say they believe in, believe all women objecting to uh, police kneeling on a man who's screaming, I can't breathe, which is what he's saying, uh, ending mass incarceration. None of that applies when you cross their agenda right. that they are trying to enact on our children. Right. So she's not against mass incar incarceration. It's not actually the suspension of law. It's just using the force of law against disfavored groups. That's what this really is. And we should just say it out loud. Loudoun County, Virginia has become the epicenter for parents fighting back against woke curriculum in school. Now, facing backlash over a reported case of sexual assault in school and a parent-led recall petition, one of the members of the controversial school board has resigned, Beth Bartz, writing in a Facebook post, quote, this was not an easy decision or a decision made in haste. It is the right decision for me and my family. Loudoun County parent Demis Christoffi joins us now. Thank you for having me. Um, so she resigned because the, the, the sex scandal broke out. And this should have been stopped from the get-go. This should have been stopped as soon as this incident happened. Yet what they did was, because they wanted to pass the transgender policy, they moved the kid from one high school to another. And they just moved one problem from one area to another area. That's what they did. They didn't care about the parent. They didn't care about the child who was raped. Right. That's not what they cared about. They cared about their policy. They cared about, you know, getting likes. They cared about getting publicity over this. So us as parents, of course we're going to be pissed off. Of course we're going to be mad. When these, these school board members, they call on to the DOJ and calling us terrorists, domestic terrorists, they're the pedophiles. They're the terrorists. They're the ones that are, they're the one that messing up with our kids' future. Where's the FBI? Where's the DOJ? Why hasn't they been investigated? No one's talking about it. Only because it broke out, the second incident happened, that's when she resigns, because she was at the school board meeting saying, is there any incident in the bathroom that we know of? And the superintendent denies the whole thing. He's next. Everybody on that school board should be resigning by tomorrow. They should not be there. Being transgender is at odds with science and God's design, as we read in Genesis 126 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Somehow, in some mysterious and wonderful way, the human male and female, in both body and spirit, are the image and likeness of God. Satan hates mankind because we are created in God's image. He is sowing confusion in the minds of our children, and he is busy in these last days devouring those who are not steadfast in the faith, as we read in 1 Peter 5, 8-11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 
To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. In Houston, there were hugs and tears, deputies trying to digest the unthinkable. Maybe three officers down at the location. Two officers shot in the leg and one in the back. They need their freeway shut down. Police say three deputy constables with Harris County, all between the ages of 26 and 30, were trying to stop a robbery and arrest a suspect outside this North Houston bar when another man sprang up and shot them from behind with an AR-15 rifle. Good always trumps evil. And uh, what happened tonight was evil. And uh, now the good is going to sweep in and, and, and I hope for swift justice. After taking one person into custody on scene, Houston police soon realized the shooter was still at large. Suspect in custody does not match the clothing description. They're still searching for one suspect. This latest violence, tragically, coming as hundreds of fallen officers were honored in D.C. Now, Deputy Kareem Atkins will join those sobering ranks. He just returned from paternity leave, married with a six-month-old child. The other men injured were Joaquin Barthen and Daryl Garrett, whose fiancé told our Houston station, KPRC, that a bullet struck his spine. He's in critical condition. I'm just praying and asking God to watch over him, all of us. She says the couple just got engaged a week ago. Now minds are racing as our investigators trying to track down the shooter who dealt the whole Houston area a devastating blow. How, how somebody can do something like this? Just being at a club, how? How can you have so much hate in your heart? Britain is reeling from a brazen attack on a member of parliament who was murdered in front of his constituents. The suspect, said to be a British citizen, was quickly arrested. Counterterrorism officials are leading the investigation. Stabbed to death inside a church while serving those he cared for most. And for now, British police are treating the murder as an act of terror. Sir David Amos was holding an open meeting with constituents when, witnesses say, a man wielding a knife charged in and stabbed the 69-year-old politician multiple times. Emergency teams were quick to respond to the scene in Essex, east of London, but paramedics were unable to save his life. Police arrested a 25-year-old man on suspicion of murder and recovered a knife. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the entire country was heart-stricken. And the reason I think people are so shocked and saddened is, above all, he was one of the kindest, nicest, most gentle people in politics. The father of five was a hardline Brexit supporter who had served as a Conservative member of Parliament for nearly 40 years. Amos is the second British lawmaker to be killed in just over five years. Labor MP Joe Cox was shot and stabbed in the street while meeting with her constituents. In Alabama, four people were shot when gunfire erupted at a high school football game Friday night. Police say one person is in critical condition. The crowd ran to the exits. Some of the players actually dropped to the ground to try to avoid any of the shots. You see this all going down here. It happened on an exit ramp outside Lad Peebles Stadium in Mobile, just as the game between two rival teams was coming to an end.
No arrests have been made yet. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Witnesses said the missionaries were forced out of a bus at gunpoint after visiting an orphanage Saturday outside Port-au-Prince. The group includes five men, seven women, and five children, the youngest just two years old. Authorities suspect they were snatched by the notorious 400 Mowozo Gang, whose name roughly translates to 400 inexperienced men, and has a reputation for taking hostages for ransom. The gang was responsible for the kidnappings of five Catholic priests and two nuns earlier this year. One expert told the New York Times the kidnappers could demand as much as $1 million per hostage for each of the 17. But he also said the kidnappers are not terrorists, and he's confident the hostages would be freed unharmed if the ransom is paid. The U.S. State Department is in contact with Haitian officials, and the ministry told CNN the kidnappers have made contact with them. The ministry said in a statement, we are seeking God's direction for a resolution, and authorities are seeking ways to help. U.S. officials now are working, I'm sure, around the clock to uh, uh, free these missionaries. Since the assassination of its president earlier this year, criminal gangs now rule the streets in Haiti, and kidnapping is one of the only growth industries. This year, more than 360 people have been reported kidnapped with ransoms funding the gang's activities. Their intent is to make money. They are doing these kidnappings for ransom, for money. No politics are involved. It's not terrorism. Uh, their goal is to make as much money as they can from the hostage taking. Unfortunately, missionaries are often the target of these crimes. It happened earlier this year with the shooting of an American missionary and in 2019 when an armed mob attacked a missions group came around a corner and all of a sudden here the roads blocked off there's burning tires there's debris there's a you know this mass crowd of 100 120 people there the window blew out behind my head and uh, a couple seconds after that I heard Doug yell I'm dying I've been hit a doctor seriously wounded in that attack nearly died doctors called it a miracle he survived Christian Aid offers Bible classes, runs a medical clinic, helps orphans, and distributes seeds to farmers in Haiti. It's considered one of the best-funded mission organizations on the island. Christian Aid is asking believers to join us in praying for those who are being held hostage, the kidnappers, and the families, friends, and churches of those affected. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24 verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 
The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. As Russia and China were in the middle of conducting joint naval drills today, similar to these seen here, a $1 billion U.S. guided missile destroyer decided to get a little too close for comfort. This is footage of the USS Chafee in the Sea of Japan, provided by Russia's Defense Ministry, which says that the U.S. Navy's destroyer attempted to intrude into Russia's territorial waters. According to the ministry, the Russian Navy's Admiral Trilitz destroyer came as close as 66 yards from the U.S. ship, which eventually changed course and sped away. The U.S. warship allegedly ignored repeated warnings to leave the Peter the Great Gulf, an area which was declared off-limits due to the joint Russia-China Navy exercises, which included artillery drills. This is not the first time that Russia has had a run-in with Western military forces at sea this year. Back in June, Russia says that its borders were violated in the Black Sea and that warning shots were fired from Russian patrol ships as well as a bomb dropped from a warplane to keep a British destroyer out of its territorial waters. While the UK has denied the account, at the time, President Putin called the incident a provocation. We are in our territory fighting for ourselves, for our future. It is not us who came to them crossing thousands of kilometers by air or by water. It is they who approached our borders and violated our maritime territory, and that is an essential element of this situation. The incident was the first time since the Cold War that Moscow acknowledged using live ammunition to deter a NATO warship. This followed another tense encounter in November 2020, in which the U.S. Navy destroyer John S. McCain also invaded Russian waters in Peter the Great Bay and was chased off by a Russian destroyer, which threatened to ram the American vessel if it did not change course. As for the latest incident with the USS Chafee in the Sea of Japan, Russia has said that the maneuvers of the American destroyer represented a crude violation of international guidelines and a 1972 agreement between Russia and the U.S. on preventing air and naval incidents. The Russian Ministry of Defense summoned the U.S. military attaché to protest the incident. There are reports that U.S. officials have disputed the account, calling the interaction safe and professional. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. In Yemen's seven years of a war, the guns have rarely fallen silent. Now, a fierce battle for control is being waged in the northeast. Houthi rebels are fighting to capture Marib. The oil-rich province is the Yemeni government's last stronghold in the north. After weeks of siege and fighting, the Houthis say they're encircling and capturing more areas, including a strategic gateway to Marib city and parts of neighboring Shabwa province. The areas are 3,200 square kilometers. Hundreds of the mercenaries have been killed and wounded, including elements from Al-Qaeda and ISIL, and many weapons have been seized. The armed forces salute the role of the tribes of Marib and Shabwa and people of both provinces against the aggressors. The armed forces will continue the liberation of more territories. Saudi-backed Yemeni government forces and their allied tribal fighters are pushing back, with dozens of airstrikes and a ground offensive in Marib. Marib already hosts hundreds of thousands of displaced people from across Yemen. The UN says thousands more have been displaced by the fighting in the province in the last month. A siege by Houthis is stopping humanitarian aid and critical medical supplies from reaching those who need them. The UN is urging both sides to allow safe passage for civilians and aid workers. But so far, those calls have been ignored. Rahwa is four years old and being treated for severe malnourishment. Her family has managed to get her to hospital in a region where many can't. While there's some baby formula available today, 
There's no meat, eggs, or milk. Since the evening of June 28, seven people have died of hunger here at the Eider Hospital. Swelling in people's limbs is an indicator of malnutrition, and it's surging in Tigray, according to UNICEF. Mizan brought her child here. When she got sick, she didn't get the proper treatment in our village. That was because of the situation there. She didn't get proper medical help. It's been like this since June, when fighters from the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, captured the capital Mekele. And the Ethiopian federal government put its population of half a million under blockade. 14% of much needed aid has entered the region since then, according to the UN, and no medicine. The number of children being admitted to hospital has doubled this year as their families run out of food, water, fuel, and the cash they need to survive. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat, as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Streets turned into rivers. Entire hillsides appearing to melt under heavy rain. Such heavy rainfall in the Indian state of Kerala was unexpected and has claimed several lives. Soldiers have been flown in to help with rescue efforts. This team is trying to reach others trapped beneath shifting mud, while this fruits and vegetables vendor does what little he can to save his business. At around 3.30 or 4 p.m. water started rising and most of our stuff was damaged. We managed to save some vegetables like onions, but most of our vegetables have been destroyed. The monsoon season ended in September. And after months of heavy storms, locals were not expecting another one bringing such wet conditions. Farmers here rely on rains to produce crops, but too much creates problems like waterborne diseases. While the cleanup and rescue work goes on, the waters are slowly starting to recede. One of the most well-known verses of scripture showing that God controls the weather is found in Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be? that even the winds and the sea obey him. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving an unrepentant world. The world is witnessing unprecedented extreme weather that will carry over into the tribulation period, and the news headlines prove it. Are any of you suffering from end times fatigue? Are world events weighing heavily on your mind? Are the everyday wars and rumors of wars, government uprisings, violence, wickedness, and extreme weather events making you long for Jesus' return? If you said yes to these questions, you are not alone. I want to encourage those of you who are growing weary as much as we want Jesus to return, God has a perfect plan. God wants as many people to be saved as possible, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 8, and 9. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance.
There are five responses we should have concerning Bible prophecy in the end times. The first is obedience. Jesus said this in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Christians need to be living holy lives as we read in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? The second response is worship. Our worship on earth will one day become worship in heaven, as we read in Revelation 5, 8 through 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, and to open its seals. For you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. The third response is proclamation. The message of God's salvation and the truth of the rapture and Christ's second coming need to be proclaimed for all to hear, especially to those who don't yet believe. Romans 10:17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We must give everyone the chance to turn to God and be saved from his coming wrath. The fourth response is service. All believers should be diligent about carrying out God's will and performing good works. Part of Christ's judgments will be of the works performed by believers. Those works do not determine a Christian's acceptance into heaven, but they do show what each follower of Jesus did with the gifts given to a believer by God. The Apostle Paul says this concerning this coming judgment, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 The fifth response is fellowship, as we read in Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The last response to God's prophetic word is watching and praying, as we read in Luke 21.36. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus continually tells us to be ready for his coming, which could happen at any time, as we read in Matthew 24:42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. While watching, Luke tells us how Christians are to be living their lives, as we read in Luke 21, 34, and 35. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. There is coming a time when we will no longer grow tired of the end times, as we read in Isaiah 40, 28-30. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God will remove every tear from our eyes, and there will be no more pain, as we read in Revelation 21.4 and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation 
he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God. Our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!